Welcome back to Death Watch's Call of Cthulhu campaign, Descent into Darkness, Season 2. My name is Travis, and I'll be your keeper today. And once again, we have a very special, intimate episode with just Justin and John joining me, so I'll have them introduce their characters, and we will get back into it. Hello, I'm Justin. I'm playing Lance Monroe, museum curator of the occult, and currently having an interesting conversation about lucid dreaming with uh, one Dr. Call, a member of the Hermetic Order of the Silver Twilight. I'm John playing James Whitmire, and if I remember correctly, I'm heading up uh, to a safe house in New York to check on some things. Oh, okay. Were you um, still going to try and stop and see Detective Nichols? I... That's right. I do need to stop and see Detective Nichols. So I guess New York will be on hold for now. Okay. All right, yeah, so last time we played, you guys had been mostly concerned with deciding which course of action you were going to take to exonerate Charlie Murphy from his murder charge, and you had settled on maybe swapping out some documents at the Danvers Asylum so that you could show that uh, Wallace Bowers, there we go, the boy that had been driven insane evidently during one of these rumored ceremonies that these kids at the Porcellian Final Club at Harvard had performed. But in the course of solving that problem, you were concerned about who all knew about his supposed date he was committed and if the police were involved. And to that end, Mr. Whitmire had set out to talk to Detective Nichols. Now, you remember his country home was roughly an hour outside of Boston, in the suburbs of Boston. So you have been in your car for some time now, but you pull in front of that familiar country home with its well-appointed landscape and uh, rambling, roomy house, and you knock at the door, and to your delight, Detective Nichols answers the door with a somewhat surprised look on his face. He's like, ah, Mr. Whitmire, I did not expect to see you here today. Well... Sorry to drop by unannounced, but I had a a couple things that I had wanted to ask you in in hopes of uh, wrapping up this Mr. Dooley's murder and the what could affect the final outcome for Charlie Murphy. Well, of course. uh, Come in, come in. I was just about to have a nightcap. Can I offer you one? Um, Just some water, please, or some coffee. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, we can. Let's uh, go in the kitchen here and I'll put on a pot. And we can talk about that. So he leads you through the, the house to the kitchen where there is a little table set next to a window. And he starts some coffee going. And he mentions, he says, yes, I was looking into it a little bit more myself. I had gone to visit uh, Murrow Beckett's mother and father to ask about the disappearance. Because the last he was seen was at his home in his bedroom. So that's what I had done with my day. But... uh we can talk about that in a moment. Uh, what specifically are we dealing with here? So, do you remember uh, hearing or seeing anything in case files about, uh, I apologize now, I forgot that kid's name. Wallace, Wallace Bowers. Bowers. Yeah, Wallace Bowers. And uh, when he was committed to to this uh, sanitarium he's currently in? Uh, no, not with the the Charlie Murphy case. It is possible that in some cases, if if they're disturbing the peace, they'll be arrested before they're committed. So if that were the case, there would be some paperwork at the police station. But I don't know, I you know, I, I can't remember seeing anything about Wallace Bowers. Of course, I haven't been there in a couple of days. Is, is he currently out on a leave right now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a administrative leave he was placed on it. And he still doesn't quite understand why. Um, is there anybody that you that you can trust there to keep quiet to check and see if there's any type of documentation? Yes, that shouldn't be too much trouble to arrange. I could get you that information if there is anything by tomorrow. Yeah, I think tomorrow would be would be great. And I'm not sure because I, I don't make too many trips over here exactly how much he's uh, he's privy to, but. Uh, 
I'll I'll start running through kind of uh, just everything that that's happened so far since uh, the since the attorney got kidnapped and just kind of catch him up on anything. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think for Detective Nichols part, he he is mostly aware of all the mundane happenings and when it comes to like the consortium, it it would be just the general corruption in Boston, you know, these politicians and criminals and other powerful people that work together, but he wouldn't know about any, you know, serpent folk or or anything like that. However, he does have a connection to the dream as I believe you were there at that dinner when it was first sort of revealed what was going on with the toad statues and everything. So, you know, he do, he knows a little bit about that, but. I think I was there the second one. Oh, okay. yeah. The first one, I think it was just me and Dr. Andrews. Oh, that's right. You were laying low because. Yeah. Of, uh, I think there, that there uh, they told us about it, though. Yeah. yeah later on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, you know, he listens and he's glad to hear that James Clark is doing well. And he goes into a little bit about what he's been up to. And he says, yes, so I paid a visit to Murrow Beckett's home. I talked to his parents about his disappearance uh, back in April, I believe. Uh, I can't really say I got anything of great interest, or at least that would help us with Charlie Murphy, but you might find some of it interesting. They last saw him in his room, and the mother at least is certain that he never left. They heard no disturbances from his room during the night. It was though he simply vanished when they went to check on him in the morning. The mother was insistent that someone had been in his room, but she was vague about how she had come by this knowledge. Women's intuition, I suppose. They let me look at his room, and it had been untouched since he vanished, and it was generally well kept. The primary feature of the room was a large table upon which were war miniatures and colored paints. There was also a copy of this little book here, and he hands it to you. And you can see on the cover, it says Little Wars, and it's written by H.G. Wells. And when you flip to the back, it has a drawing of, you know, three men in suits, but they're sort of kneeling or or sitting around the floor, and they have all these little miniature, you know, like Napoleonic War type figurines with cannons and and miniature houses and all that kind of stuff set around. And it just looks like they're reenacting a little battle. But he says, um... Take a look inside. It's just like the almanac from Mr. Dooley's home. And when you flip through it, sure enough, you see it's just Latin written over and over. It looks like the same phrase after you flip through a few pages. But uh, I don't know what that means. It's definitely pretty odd. Uh, I think that uh, the Mr. Monroe will know what it means uh, once we show him, I hope, at least. Um, but I'll, do you mind if I take this? Oh, absolutely. Go for it. Uh, I also nabbed his personal journal, which was not kept at his home, but it was at, you know, his, in his desk at school when I was on the campus the day before. And you can take a look at that as well. Let me share that with you, John. Okay. So yeah, this is just a sl slim leather bound journal with leather straps to hold it closed. Uh, did you get that shared with you? Yeah, I got it here. And it's quite extensively written in. It might take you an hour or so to go through it completely, but assuming you will do that next, I'll read through what jumps out at you as having some interest to what you guys have been doing. Yeah, as I, I would start uh, going through it immediately. Bear with me here. All right, so this is Murrow Beckett, the boyfriend of Betty Williams, a member of Porcelian, and part of this nucleus of dabblers and the dark arts that may have been responsible for Mr. Dooley's death. And also, just like Wallace Bowers, he at times claimed to be responsible for the ritual and also denied it. But anyhow, beginning in January 1920, he writes, It is the first day back from winter break and I have made a new friend, William Murrow Jr., the son of the late congressman by the same name. He is an interesting fellow, polite if a bit stodgy, and embarrassingly out of sync with men's fashion. I made a joke about wearing his father's old suits, and by a flash of distemper in his countenance, I was prepared to ignore the man from that point. However, I found myself in conversation on occult matters, and was impressed with his knowledge of Madame Blavatsky, the witch-haunted history of Massachusetts, and other more esoteric matters. 
Free of our duties, we spent the afternoon amidst the stacks delving further into the subject. I have never quite met anyone like him. There is a certainty in his manner that goes beyond the inflated ego of most of the other men on campus, as though his goal and direction in life have been settled long ago. He reminds me of my own father in that way. March 2nd, 1920. Today Murrow gave me an invitation to Porcelain. I could barely contain my excitement to have been chosen by such an elusive club. My father would be beyond pleased. This was, after all, the storied final club from which Teddy Roosevelt came, who must be my father's favorite person in all of the world. And that's just the top of the list of esteemed men to come from those hallowed halls. I accepted immediately, and my initiation was set for this upcoming weekend. In the meantime, I am to brush up on my Latin and purify myself. That is to say, no food or drink 24 hours in advance. March 7th, 1920. I feel as though I have entered a dream. The barn, as they call it, has an aura of deep history. Within are pictures of its esteemed members, past and present. To think that I shall stand amongst such legends is a bit heady. Each of the other members was precisely what I expected, erudite and well-bred. I was introduced to an honorary member who was in town on business and had been at Harvard in the same class as Mr. Roosevelt. This Mr. Blackman assured me he knew the president very well, and told of a time the pair of them had snuck into the girls' do dorm over at Radcliffe. It was not until later that it occurred to me Mr. Blackman must have been joking, as he could be no older than forty. I suppose I shall have to get used to that. Porcelain is notorious for being tricksome. Nevertheless, Mr. Blackman gave a small welcome speech to those recently initiated. He joked that Porcelain's ultimate goal was nothing less than world domination, and that honorary members such as himself had high expectations for the crop this year as he put it. April 14th, 1920. After much debate, it has been settled. Given that the Abramelin ritual takes months to perform and seems really quite boring in my opinion, we have settled, in, settled on summoning a lesser demon, Lucifuge, as outlined in the Grand Grimoire. While I am unbelievably excited by this prospect, I wonder if I really believe any of this. Most often, I think that I don't. However, when I am discussing such matters with Will, his absolute faith is infectious. Of course, such belief evaporates when I go home. Furthermore, we have allied ourselves with a few of the brothers. With all other matters settled, we will perform the ritual this weekend. Will says he has the perfect spot. April 15, 1920. Needless to say, we did not summon a demon. I am not disappointed. My instruction in the sciences does not allow me to believe such things as demons or devils truly exist. There was a bit of the ritual that called for animal sacrifice. Cole had snatched a poor alley cat for that purpose. I am not sure if I thought we would really go through with it. The whole time we were lowering the thing into the boiling solution, I felt certain that one of us would come to our senses. To my shame, I simply observed the process expecting some other intervention. I suppose my brothers were thinking the same thing. Well, except for Wade, who found the whole experience the height of comedy. But in the end, there were no devils be they greater or lesser, or specters to haunt us. Only the very real type of haunting that occurs in memory. I can still hear the cat yowling during its ignoble death. And for what? For foolish men to play at black magic? This fascination with the occult is as childish as my painted figures of war. <coughs> my father would be delighted to hear such an admission. August 1st, 1920. With the fall semester looming, I must say the summer has been a relief. I had diverted my brothers with reoccurring matches of miniature warfare culminating in a reenactment of the Battle of Waterloo. I even enticed Whelan to join in us with the promise that he could command Napoleon's forces, which seemed to fit his sensibilities. Will was often disappointed at these little gatherings as though there were better and greater things to accomplish. However, our match, which lasted an entire Saturday and took up the whole of the study, even had him in good spirits, and I was reminded of our bond. He was truly my brother. Of course, the dark delvings continued apace, although thankfully free of blood sacrifice. Seances and other acts of quaint spiritualism, as Will called it, were performed to greater or lesser effect. One thing of note, we had planned to perform a seance in an old haunted house here in Boston, but were warned off by a nosy shopkeeper. While I agree that the fellow ought to mind his business, Will was beyond enraged. Of course, I was aware of his temper. It was well known the very public disagreements that Will and had with his professors, but this was something else entirely. For one frightening moment, I thought he was going to strike the man, but then it passed. 
Wade formulated a prank to play on the shopkeeper, which put Will in better spirits. Will has his sights set on government work as his father before him, and he truly does have an intimate understanding of politics, but I fear his temper of his will get the better of him one day. August 11th, 1920. Mr. Blackman visited the barn again today, and he had lunch with Will and me. Away from the heady circumstances of my initiation, I found the man unpleasant in some ineffable way. However, my attention was soon distracted by an old and moldering tome he showed us. The faint script on the cover identified it as the Liber Ivanus. Evidently, in past conversations with Will, Mr. Blackman had become aware of our dabbling, and he thought the book might be of interest to us. Will's reaction to the book was one of unshuttered greed, with something like recognition, perhaps? Mr. Blackman told us it was a ninth century translation of a much older book. There are myths of antediluvian civilizations and of lost continents, and by chance this work was filtered down through the cataclysms of history. Indeed, the book was unlike any grimoire we had thus far studied. There were complex diagrams and bizarre geometry that seemed to defy the surface area of the pages, along with one particularly troubling illustration of an obese, drowsing hybrid of bat and toad. With some remorse, Mr. Blackman informed us that his work was incomplete due to the ravages of time, but that he was in the process of finding a copy in better condition. For now, he said, there were many complete spells that could be learned if one were so inclined. November 1920. This shall be my last entry. Something terrible has occurred. I cannot even consider it directly, but it bounces around the periphery of my mind like an approaching shadow. Will has become unhinged and commanded us to call him Ibon. All these months of dabbling have broken the man. He raves about sacred lines laid down by those who were old when the earth was young, converging on him. I do not understand what he is talking about, but I believe him. Dear gods, I believe him. I fear we have unleashed something into this world that by every law, be it natural or religious, should not be. Poor Wallace, he was taken. Before cowardice overcame me, I gazed into the portal from whence it came and saw a thousand versions of myself reflected back at me. A thousand times a thousand, but they were not me. They were not me. I fled into the night, away from it, away from Will, who, in my last fleeting memory of that night, had become seemingly old and bent. Surely it was deception, for when I saw him on the next occasion, he appeared as he always had. But mostly, I fled from those corrupted shades of myself. And of course, there's a lot of entries in there with more mundane things that talk about him and Betty or him and some of the other brothers, but they don't seem to touch on the case or anything like that. Well, uh, so after reading the those entries, I'll just put it down and ask, uh, ask Wayne if... The, if he's read this. Yeah, I, I, it wasn't lost on me that we have a parallel here between what Dooley had written in his journal about his interaction with the Harvard boys, and now we have some names associated to it, in writing at least. A pity it doesn't get more detailed, but I am now very interested in this William Murrow Jr. character. Well, I, the, I would say that this, along with his confession would pretty much seal him as the uh, the main suspect, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I would agree with that. Nice. But um, as I understand it, the boy is missing, so what can be done about it? Do you have any leads on where he's at? As I thought he was the one that was in the... Oh, no, that's the other one, Wallace. Okay. Um, no, unfortunately, I don't, but uh, there is one of his accomplices... Uh, that's locked up in Danvers right now. I believe he's also confessed. Yeah, uh, Wallace Powers. I, we talked about him the last time we met, I believe. So maybe, maybe he'll, if he ever regains his senses, maybe he'll have <laughs> a little bit more information. But some of the things that I've seen recently, if if something like what took uh, Murrow Beckett got him i don't think we'll ever see him again well that's vaguely ominous well what do you what do you mean by something i'll uh i'll try to describe the uh the hunter that uh me and dr andrews encountered uh when we met with betty williams okay yeah he uh 
listens to your description and there's sort of like a wry smile uh, playing at his lips and you can see he's about to dismiss it but it's possible with you know maybe a a charm or i suppose even a fast talk you could you could uh, impress on him the truth of what you're saying can i try a persuade or i guess yeah, charm is be- actually a little bit high, higher so either one yeah go for it uh no no persuade yeah you know it's just like I know that it sounds far-fetched, but if you visit, what was the school that we had went to? Was it uh, Radcliffe that we were at where we met Betty? Oh, you were at the University of Boston. Oh, there you go. Yeah, as if you if you go and, and look at the uh, radio room at the University of Boston, I mean, if, even if you uh, go and take witness statements from near Mr. Monroe's uh, residence, I mean, he encountered one. In his in his own apartment, as it was a newspaper article about it too. Yeah, as it was even in the papers. <laughs> as and just it, wait for the one that'll come out tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah, that's true. Well, you know, his smile kind of falters a little bit, and he's my apologies, Mister Whitmire. I I don't mean to cast doubt on what you're saying. It's it's just all very difficult to to take in. Have you spoken with? Dr. Andrews about this? You mentioned that Monroe had some encounter, and they all agree on your description of this thing? They do, and, and I, I don't fault you or blame you at all. The, it is extremely difficult to, to believe. Yeah, if I hadn't seen it myself, uh, I would be under the same uh, assumptions as you that someone was just having a go at me. But uh, having seen it, as uh I know now that there's there's more than just us out there, and we are like flies to these things. I will take it on your good word, Mr. Whitmire, but let's leave it aside for now, given its remarkable nature, and lay out the facts. So here we have in this journal that Murrow Beckett, well, at least in my reading of it, he seems to place the uh, blame for getting into the mess, at least on Will and part, or, or at least that was my takeaway. Did you get the same impression? I did. And from what I understand about the last time you guys talked, you had this Wallace Bowers who's been committed, who has apparently confessed. At least that's what I gathered from Dr. Call's frequent telegrams. And this is the person we are going for now. Well, he's the only one of them left, as far as I'm aware. I wonder if I should risk it and pay a visit to this barn, the Porcellian Club, tomorrow. I've uh, shied away from talking to these boys directly because I'm not actively a police officer and I could get in even worse trouble. But what are your thoughts, Whitmire? Did I risk it? (laughs) I mean, I would, (laughs) but... (laughs) (laughs) As uh, I can also tell you that uh, the... The people behind this wield far, far more power than uh, what we could actually, or what you could actually defend against. As I and mean, if you if you cherish your your uh, your job, you know your family and your life overall, I'd probably say leave it for now. Well, I'll take your advice. I'll uh, head to the or I'll contact my friends at the police station and see if we can find any mention of Wallace Bowers being arrested and then committed, and I'll get that information to you tomorrow. But if you'll pardon me, I am ready for bed. The missus is waiting for me. I'll uh, stand up and extend my hand and say that I appreciate the uh, information, and I look forward to talking to him tomorrow. Yeah, he shakes your hands and sees you to the door. Good luck with those nightmares. (laughs) All right. <laughs> That's uh, so, uh, jokes. Jokes. We'll, <laughs> we'll leave you with your journey back to Boston. Where are you headed next? Just um, I'll to sleep. Yeah, I'll I'll head back over to uh, I'll head over to uh, safe house in Boston. As uh, probably the one that I'd been using. Okay, and then we will bounce over to Mister Monroe, who has been in conversation about all things strange and occult with Dr. Call. He had also penned a message for Logan Terry to inform him about the Wilbur Theater. 
and its connection mm-hmm. to this group in Boston. And there was another part to it that escapes me at the moment. Yeah, all of the uh, skin suits that... Oh, Dr. the names had, had that Dr. Andrews... Sending yeah. names so that he may be aware of other... If other people that may be doppelgangers should... Uh, that actually be what those skin suits are. Yeah, so you are there when you hear a commotion out in the the lounge, and you even recognize the somewhat panicked sound of Dr. Andrew's voice as he's entered the lounge and a bunch of remarks from the people that were sitting there uh, conversating while you and Dr. Call are in the bar. What would you like to do? Well, I'll, uh, of course, be curious and step out, probably with dr call following me yeah so you see that dr andrews has come into the lounge and he has one arm over his shoulder where he's supporting uh james clark who is in a hospital gown and looks quite exhausted and both of them have a a somewhat a panicked expression in their face their eyes are darting around particularly dr andrews is looking all over this lounge you know and uh, you feel a, a connection to that sort of darting, searching look. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, he's being hunted. I know that look. <laughs> right. You know it well. Um, but I'll rush over and kind of jokingly say, uh, I knew you were going to see uh, Mr. Clark, but I don't think we need his his help quite this urgently. Well, yeah, I'll, he... I'll try and uh, take uh, the weight of Dr. Clark off of off of Dr. Andrews and help him, you know, move him towards a, a lounge area yeah he um uh, some of the other men your your fellow members stand up and they're like what's the meaning of this or or they're offering help you know like like one uh philip helps you with james clark to get him settled into one of the comfy chairs in there and a lot of questions are going out you know because of how panicked they look but dr andrews gets a hold of himself although you saw for an instant he was about to to start speaking about what had happened, but he uh, he guards himself and uh, he just makes some some excuse for the circumstance. So <laughs> not a very good one. Like he just didn't like the hospital room he was in, so we're moving him. But don't worry, he's under my my medical supervision. He'll be quite all right. Although you can see you can see there's a little bit of bleeding coming from the missing portion of his arm, like it's about midway between the shoulder. And the elbow, elbow where they had made the amputation, and they'd flapped some skin over it, and it's been bandaged up. But you can see that whatever they had been doing had caused the stitches to break, and it's bleeding a little bit. Okay. Seeing that, I'll, I'll uh, look at Dr. Call and, and say, is there a first aid kit nearby? Uh, yes, I believe so. I, I will run and get it post-haste. Yeah. Good, and good. He, Thank you. Thank you, He sir. darts away. And Dr. Andrews is like, gentlemen, gentlemen, please back up and give... Uh, Mr. Clark, some space here. He is still recovering. I assure you he'll be okay, but please just back away. Give us some space to work. And this has the intended effect where you have at least a bubble of maybe 20 feet where you guys can talk privately. And he begins to tend to this wound, uh, realizing that it'll need to be restitched. But all the while, he's talking to you and, and laying out what had happened since his visit to James Clark. And that was a daring escape, you know, the appearance of the Dark Hunter and then a daring escape out of the hospital across Boston to a police station. And then okay. from there into a cab back to here. I'll ask him, did you manage to kill it? No, I I shot it, wounded it, I think, but uh, I just ran. Then it may still be hunting. Um, we need to find a way out of here quick. Well, where do we go if it can get us here? It can get us anywhere. I don't know, but somewhere with... Uh few more people with weapons, I, I would imagine, would probably be the best best place, or preferably somewhere that we could trap it, or, or I, I don't know. These, these are matters that I'm, I'm not an expert in, but all I know is that it, it refused to stop hunting me until it was hit by that truck. Well, yes, I, uh, he, he, he tells a little bit of his flight, where he had pushed through a narrow gap between two buildings that he was sure the Dark Hunter would not be able to follow him through. But when they got to the other side, it had fashioned one of those strange portals they used to travel and appeared in the police station when we got here. But that was that was only a few minutes for it to appear again. It's taken me 20 minutes in this cab to get here. Is it possible we've thrown off the trail, at least for now? 
I don't understand how these things work. About these things, so I I can't guarantee whether or not it's it's lost its tracking. Uh, Do you happen to know whether it was coming after you or or uh, Mr. Clark? I can't say for certain, as I had Clark with me the whole time. Uh, And those things, they they don't have features that I can I can't make out body language or facial expression or anything like that. That makes it a little more difficult, unfortunately. If it's after Mr. Clark, then we can't leave him alone. But at the same time, if it's after you, we need to make sure that you're safe as well. Um, Maybe McCracken could be of some help. I, your thought of going someplace where people have guns, you know, immediately I think police station. But I imagine if I appear at a police station again, they may detain me. Yes, Mr. McCracken might be good, but even he only has so much firepower and these things are terribly terribly effective at killing people. Well, I can't think uh, of any other solution. Well, you know, it's times like these I wish that we still had Mr. Staten. Him and his uh, elephant gun would, would come in most handy right now. I agree. Uh, I suppose our next best opportunity might be to see if Mr. Whitmire has any companions that, that would also be able to help protect us. Although Mr. McCracken may, may know of some people as well. So perhaps we... And go to McCracken's, get off a telegram to Whitmire, and then move location from there? What do you think? Yes, yes, that would be a good plan, although as long as we keep vigilant for that, I don't know if you noticed it as well, but a, a certain smell has always uh, permeated the air just before those things take form. Yes, the Latakia, same smell yes, that, that Murphy tried to warn us about. That is the smell. I, I had always attributed it to the smell of wood smoke, but I, I suppose it is the same smell as that Latakia. Well, I would be in much a state as you had I not been lectured by a very knowledgeable tobacconist recently. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, well. at, at that point, Dr. Call appears with the, the kit, and they both get busy putting him back together. So uh, Dr. Andrews starts sewing that up. But once they have him in reasonable shape, Dr. Andrews poses the question of what to do about Clark, because if the thing was after Clark, then I don't know. I, I thought we had made arrangements with the consortium. Like, why why would so they be targeting I, me or Clark? I, I have no idea. I had believed that we had as well. Perhaps I need to go and speak with them again, and or at least through their contact, to see if we had done something to anger them. Um, do you want to take Mr. Clark to... Ben McCracken, and I can go try and speak to their contact. Okay, that's what we'll do then. And I'll send off that message to Mr. Whitmire. Very good. Um, and I will head straight away to the contact of the consortium. Okay, so the uh, the lodge hall does have a like a car service or somebody that services them particularly that you can use mm-hmm. for for quick transportation, or you could walk a short distance and, and seek the public transportation. I'll probably use public transportation because I'd, I'd rather not have anyone know where I was going. Okay, yeah, when you're trying to depart there, Dr. Call's looking at the situation with Clark and looking at you leaving, and he uh, seems somewhat torn, but finally he tears himself away from Dr. Andrews, and he's like, Mr. Monroe, I dare say you shouldn't run off on your own with, with uh, some unknown threat lurking about. Perhaps I should join you. I'll think about it for a second, and then uh, say, I'll, I'll, I'll welcome your company, but there may be some things that I will need to take care of on my own while we're out, and I must insist that when the time comes for me to forge ahead alone, that you, you respect my wishes. Of course, of course. Please lead the way, Mr. Monroe. And he, fall, he follows on your heel as you guys wait for this car service, and it's not very long before uh, a car pulls up into the parking area around Lodge Hall, and you guys are on the streets heading to wherever you want to go first, Mr. Monroe. You remember that, what was it, a, a shop? The Yeah, they did like shop. blinds and yeah and things like that. Yeah, okay. All right, so once again, it being very late when you arrive, it's closed up for the evening, but you tap on the window, and the blinds move to the side, and there's that woman that you met the previous time you were here, and she looks mildly annoyed at your arrival, but she understands why you must be here, and she lets you in to the empty shop. 
And she's very terse. She's like, what is it? Say, so, uh, I need to speak with them again. Okay. But make it quick, please. Hopefully and it will be very quick. Thank you. So she moves that stationary out onto the counter and disappears somewhere and comes back with this gate box, this little miniature gate box that you have been using for communication with the weird crystalline lights on it. And she opens it towards you and waits for you to compose your message. I'll compose my message asking if they had sent the hunter after us. And, you know, after that saying, I, I thought that we had come to a, an agreement. Yeah, so you see the the lights go through their routine of message sent, and then a short while later, message received, and she opens the box again, and there is a, a piece of paper in there, folded in half, and you open it, and it says, our agreement still stands. We did not send a dark hunter after you. Okay, I'll respond with, do you know who did and how we can protect ourselves from it. And the response is, we do not know who did. Hmm. Nothing else? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll send a message back again asking, how can we stop it? Okay, the message that comes back says, it's uh, troublesome for people to use the Tark Hunters because it actually sets in motion something that cannot be stopped. It dabbles with space and time, and the Dark Hunter pursues its prey until the appropriate cor corrections are made. The Summoner could undo the ceremony to recall the change it made to the space-time. Okay. I'll, I'll say, I guess I'll send back, can we send a counter change? That may be possible, although very dangerous. And I'll uh, send back the next one saying, we use the same channels to... Try to correct it as to summon it? Yes. Okay. Here, I or though I must warn you that commands sent to the Dark Hunters that serve counter purposes can have devastating consequences. Such as? <laughs> <laughs> like devastating consequences is a fairly vague term, and <laughs> so far everything we've done have had devastating consequences. Well, it, unfortunately, the answer is is as vague, as devastating consequences, and it just says you're complete in utter annihilation. Those are some devastating consequences. All right, I'll ask, could we get assistance? Yes. Since Meet at the Chapel of, Chapel of Contemplation Grounds tonight, midnight. Very well. All right. No more messages? No more messages. Yeah, she. Uh, the woman had been sort of huffing, like huffing annoyed, annoyingly, at your back and forth, but uh, he snaps the box shut, takes it away, and says, will that be all? I say, yes, thank you very much, and I don't have a whole lot of money on me, but I'll I'll give her like five dollars. Okay. <laughs> he pockets it, and it and thank her for softens her face a little bit. She's, she even wishes you a good night as she lets you out. Was this one of those places you were going to leave Dr. Call? Uh, uh, yeah, I was going to have him stay outside while I did this. Yeah, so he's naturally curious about it. He's like, well, what is this place? This, I can't speak too much about it, but there's a way of contacting some people here that I needed to have a discussion with. Uh, but by the by, there may be a uh, an interesting opportunity for you tonight. And I'll well, uh, mention that uh, there is a ritual that I may need to perform in order to protect the good Dr. Andrews, myself, and our companions, and perhaps you and Mr. Clark included, and I must meet someone tonight at midnight. I... If you're willing to suspend your disbelief and and face uh, perhaps some very terrifying things, then you are welcome to join me. Of course, I dare say I have not been this excited since I was a boy, and there is a distinct lack of any fear prospective rituals in his face. He just seems plainly excited. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't know what he's getting himself into. <laughs> All right, so we'll leave you there for a moment, and we'll jump back over to Whitmire as he arrives back in Boston to uh, one of his safe houses where you have a telegram waiting from Dr. Andrews. Uh, you can see it came from the hotel that 
McCracken was staying in, and, and it explains the situation about that they need somewhere safe to lay low from something pursuing them. Uh, Dr. Andrews uses vague terms in the telegram, but you do get the sense that he's talking about the thing that you saw at the University of Boston. Okay. As I'll, uh, I'll head over to the hotel, or I guess I'll, okay. well, yeah, I'll head over to the hotel as I'll take him over to them over to one myself. Okay. Yeah. So when you arrive there, McCracken opens the door and he's fully dressed and he uh, had a shotgun at the ready, but he lowers it uh, when he opens the door and sees it. It's you. And inside, Mr. Clark is laying on the bed. Uh, he's fallen asleep at this point. Dr. Andrews is sitting beside him, you know, checking his vitals at the moment you come in, but he looks up with some relief at your arrival and he says, uh, Mr. Whitmire, good to see you. We've had some trouble. I, was, uh, I just got your message and I came as quick as I could. Is, is he going to be okay to move? Yes, I believe so, but he will need to rest for a few hours. All right. Um, well, let's let's get you guys out of here before... It comes back. Okay. All right. So I think you have enough space in your car for all of them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you load up in your car and you take them to one of your safe houses. Do you have an idea? Is that where you're taking them to a safe house? Yeah. So this is what I figure is this one is just a kind of like what we uh, we were sleeping in with the kids watching is similar to that. It's just a an old warehouse that isn't really used anymore. Okay. All right. Yeah, so you guys pull up to that. Uh, again, it's because it's getting late. It's pretty quiet. Uh, you maybe take a quick look around for anybody, but you don't see anybody on the street uh, once this car that was going by passes and turns around a corner, and then you make your way into this warehouse where, much like the other one, you just have a few non-perishable food items and a bit of water, enough for a day or two. And you guys all shuffle inside. And from there, Dr. Andrews busies himself with attending to James Clark and getting him comfortable and and uh, ready to go to sleep. But McCracken pulls out his pen and paper and he's like, uh, Dr. Andrews said a little bit about what was after him, but I can't really say I fully understand how to protect against this. You got any ideas, Mr. Whitmire? Well, a 38 worked last time and all. Look at his shotgun and say that should work quite a bit better, but just be careful when you encounter it is it does something, either something to you or maybe something to time. I don't quite understand it, but I, it felt like I was impossibly slow the last time that uh, I had encountered one, although Dr. Andrews seemed to move just fine. All right, he takes it all in stride and he writes, well, I can take a watch or I suppose I could stay up the whole night if necessary. Because I think that uh, the watches, uh, rotating watches would probably be best as no one should bother you guys out here. And there's enough food and, and water to, to last the three of you at least uh, till tomorrow, you know, as long as you don't go heavy on it. As uh, Do you need me to, to stay or... No, I think I can handle it from here, Mr. Whitmire. All right. As, uh, and I'll, uh, so I'm going to switch to a different safe house, but I will let them know which one that I'm moving to. Okay. As at least uh, McCracken and, and Andrews. Okay. All right. So you move to your other safe house. What are you going to do at that point? Well, I, I did have plans to meet uh, Mr. Monroe. I believe we were going to the, we we're going to try and get into the reptile world, right? Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So depending on what time it is, I'll, uh, I'll probably start trying to prepare myself for that. Okay. Well, let's, uh, before I bounce back to Mr. Monroe, let's go ahead and get your dreaming role. So you need a success to enter the dream world. You need. Um, I'll a probably use success luck to with enter that. a specific place. Oh, so what would a hard be? What is that? Fourteen. Uh, so a thirteen. So 13. I'd need let's see twenty-two luck if I wanted to try and do that. Well, that's hefty price to pay, but yeah, it would. Yeah, it would do the job. And no, uh, I don't think because that's that's a 
over half of it as I don't think I want to spend that. Okay. So you are preparing yourself. Well, we'll actually just leave you there for a moment and go back to Mr. Monroe. So you know that the appointed time is a couple hours away to meet at the mm-hmm. old ruined chapel of contemplation. So with those two hours, was there anything you would like to do? Well, I've read about the, the Dark Hunter summoning ritual through the Libra Ivanis, right? Right. And got a little bit of understanding about it. So I, I guess I will go and send off a telegram. I will probably send off a telegram to Mr. Whitmire to let him know what was going on and to Mr. Andrews that I'm, that the, well, I'll try and find a way of, of not saying it directly, but that our deal is still on with the organization that they did not send the creature. And that I'm trying a way of halting it from continuing to hunt us. Okay. So I suppose timing wise, there's a chance that they might have received that before they all left to the second safe house, but we'll let, we'll leave that up to a, a luck roll on Mr. Whitmire's behalf. Nope. No. So it just comes in a few minutes after they depart. And, uh, so in that time you don't, you don't hear anything back from them, but the hour approaches. Okay. So yeah, I'll gather up Dr. Call and tell him to, to steal himself or whatever is about to come. Okay. All right. So you set off to the chapel of contemplation grounds, uh, you're let off by your cab driver or perhaps the tram a few streets over and you walk along the quiet roads into this old dilapidated patch of land that just a few bits of stonework remain from the old chapel of contemplation and all appears silent at first but as you step onto the grounds and you catch that familiar chipped and faded painting of the eye symbol you see four men just dark shapes at first, but with those recognizable silhouettes of the fedora-like hats, but with broader brims, sort of spring out of the shadows in front of you, and uh, a very recognizable face and voice of the man you met on the train sort of steps into one of these oil lamps that's burning along the street, just the very edge of that light, and he's dimly lit, and he says, Mr. Monroe. Yes. I'm glad you came to assist me in this endeavor yes but i must warn you this is very dangerous what you are attempting to do are you certain that you want to go through with it no but i believe that i don't have too much more of a choice this thing has continued to hunt us and it has wreaked havoc across the city in multiple occasions now and i believe that if we don't stop it then uh not just our plans, but your plans may be disrupted by it. I see. Do you understand the patterns required to summon the Dark Hunter? I'll mention that, yes, we had uh, read about it in Walter Corbett's journals, and I believe that I understand what's needed and, and am prepared. I do not think you are prepared, Mr. Monroe. It takes one such as yourself considerable amount of time to understand it properly. If you attempt this, you would be doing it ignorant to much of what is required. Well, that is why I asked for your assistance in this matter. I was hoping that where my ignorance is, that you could fill me in or prepare me the best that can be done on such short notice. There is a way. I could temporarily impress certain aspects and knowledge about this ritual into your mind, but it may not turn out well for you. Are you prepared to take that risk? I'm afraid I must. I, I believe my only other option is perhaps dying at the hands or what a this creature has for hands, and that's not an option that I'm willing to face quite yet. Well, in that case, then, prepare yourself. And one of the other consortium members steps forward uh, with a book, one of those nondescript books that you were shown in the library a few days ago that uh, took you to a strange place, you know, with non-Euclidean geometry and where you saw the 
well, what you think must be the shining trapezohedron. Yeah. And it whispered to you. So let's see here. So yes, they he passes it to Mr. Blackman, you presume, who passes it to you. And he says the information you seek is within the book. Okay. I'm really tempted to, to pass it to Dr. Call. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'll Yeah, he is just... He's very silent, but you know, there's a there's a certain buzzing energy that you detect over your left shoulder. Uh, but you're going to do it? Yeah, yeah, I will. Okay, so you must succeed on a hard power roll. All right, here goes. Ooh. Congratulations! All right. Okay, so um, so as I've described before with these books, it begins out like reading, or. Uh, mm-hmm. It begins like you're reading a a normal book, but eventually your directed, you know, movements of your eyes and understanding of words in that matter begins to change and it starts to flow in the opposite direction where the words are propelled into your mind through your eyes and at such a velocity that it becomes almost too much to bear and, and it turns into kind of almost a vision at its height. And in this vision, you are... Well, you can't see yourself, but you're surrounded by other men in robes, and you're, you know, it, you got an altar before you. It's candlelit. You're looking at what you presume to be the Libra Ivanus. You don't. You're not very well uh, read in that book quite yet. I mean, you've glanced at it, and but you yeah. you you see the Latin. It's in a different handwriting than the one that, that you have. But so you go through this like montage of of night after night of studying this and and tests on getting the designs right with what you're supposed to draw in the sky with the unalloyed dagger, uh, getting the chant right, and certain other preparations. And you can see that Mr. Blackman was quite right, and that it would have taken weeks of study for you to hold all of this knowledge in your head to perform the ritual correctly. But even so, the pace of the knowledge does leave you somewhat reeling once you come out of the state and you're not entirely certain how long you'll be able to hold on to it all. Even now it's like there's a boil in your mind that is threatening to pop and send this knowledge out of your head, but it's, it's holding for now. Okay. I'll, uh, so once I come out of it, I will pass the book on to Dr. Call and I'm assuming that we'll need the, like, I, I seem to remember there was uh, an unalloyed dagger down in Warren Bietti's tomb at that. Well, Mr. Blackman actually has one. Uh, again, another one of those consortium members steps forward this time with a uh, symbol looking at unalloyed dagger that he passes to Blackman, who passes it to you. All right. But yeah, I'll pass the book on to Dr. Call, and I will head down into the chamber where we uh, uncovered <laughs> Warren Bietti, uh, knowing that that place is on a, one of the ley lines and okay. begin preparing for the ritual. Yeah, so the uh, the first part of it requires you to pass a hard intelligence roll. Oh, not even close. I can't even luck that. All right, so uh, what has happened is you're trying to draw all this information, which is, is somewhat alienating because it's not like in information you've incorporated. It's been jammed into your head, and you're trying to draw the separate lines of thought needed to get the ritual going correctly, but a few of them escape escape you. Now, you do have some left, but it means the, that you'll be missing bits of the ritual, and you don't know what consequences that will have if you proceed from this point. Okay. Uh, you could have push the intelligence success. roll. What's that? Um, that would have been a regular success, so... Yeah, you do have the option to push it if you'd like, but I will say that perhaps making no. the necessary connections will risk some sanity loss. I mean, I Mueller did it, I, so... I, uh, <laughs> well, yeah, and it drove him completely insane. Yeah, but he still <laughs> did it. <laughs> uh, would I be able to get a bonus die if I were to, you know, ask the consortium to help me ensure that the that everything was done right? Well, you see, Mr. Monroe, that would put us at risk. And how am I not certain that this is just not some ploy on your behalf? Well, because my life is at risk as well. Well, he looks dubious at you and um you might be able to change his mind with with a uh, charm roll all right i'll give the charm roll a chance oh that was on hard so you got it would have been a success yeah yeah so uh you know you you let your very real well the truth you know come out 
and it seems to have an impact on Mr. Blackman. And he points to one of the other consortium members and says that he will assist. All right. All right. So in the ritual, you must draw these shapes in the sky or at the direction of the sky and begin a chat, a chant in Latin, which will be followed by, once again, a hard power roll, but you don't actually get the bonus die. It will just make it a regular power roll. Okay. Regular power roll. I'm glad it wasn't Congratulations. Hard. Okay. So yeah, you, after this chanting, which now you're at a point where those, that knowledge in your head, you're trying the bits and pieces you get from it. And what is required is time and the expenditure of magic points. So okay. the more you put into it ensures the, a greater success that the summoning will work but it also means it'll take more time. So it's roughly right. 10 minutes for every magic point you put into it. Okay. And, uh, and I'll just leave the percentage of success up in the air. I suppose I will use just over half of what my magic points are, so I'll, I'll do 10. How about we go? Yeah, we'll do 10. Okay. Okay, so with 10, I'm sorry, I got the timing a little bit wrong. It's five minutes, so okay. it won't be quite as long. So, oh, he's uh, a if, doctor call dealing with the book. <laughs> what is he doing with the book? Yeah. I wasn't actually sure if you wanted to have it out in the open. So I'm just assuming he's holding on to it. No, I, I, I'd pass it on to him for him to look at. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's just, he was looking through it pretty feverishly, but as you start the actual ritual itself, he becomes transfixed on what you're doing. And so, yeah, you're you're in the middle of that, and it's exhausting to hold yourself to such a high degree of attention on one task for such a long amount of time. But yeah. you do think you get through it correctly with the assistance of that consortium member who, you know, there are pauses, there's an ebb and flow in the ritual and, and you can turn and refer to him and he gives you some direction on what to do appropriately in the next step. And uh, so give me a D100 roll. Uh, that's probably not good. Well, with the amount of magic points that you pumped into it it is a success so the this portal this bending of the light with a black hole in the center begins to form and grow larger and you see a gray place beyond although the consortium member tells you to avert your eyes do not look in the portal directly okay i'll follow his direction and and kind of look down at the floor as this thing steps steps forward okay so the second part of this ritual as the dark hunter emerges, you can you get the sense of your will being battered against. It's trying to overwhelm you and go on to whatever it wants to do rather than what you want it to do. Okay. And given that it has direction already, it will make the task very, very difficult. So you're actually going to need to beat it at the extreme level with your power. However, oh. with the aid of the consortium member that does knock it up to a hard. So here is where you are, you've summoned it and now you're binding it to yourself okay. and your will. So that will need a hard power roll. Alright, here goes nothing. Oh! Nice. <laughs> okay, so go ahead and do a power increase check. Just a normal power roll? Yeah, if you fail it, then you go up. No, I would not have failed it. Okay, so yeah, it, there was this great intensity of will uh, crushing against yours, but now it's gone quiet, and the Dark Hunter sits there before you swaying. I do need a sanity roll. Wow. <laughs> You're doing pretty good. So it's a yeah. zero on a success with a Dark Hunter. I've and... seen this thing before. As long as it's not trying to attack me, I'm okay. <laughs> right. So it's it's standing before you, and you, the consortium member that was aiding you says, you can tell it your command. The simpler the language, the better. Okay. I will command it to ignore all commands to hunt myself, Dr. Andrews, Mr. Mueller, Mr. McCracken, um, just kind of list out all the people that are part of our, our investigation. Okay. All right. One second here. Is there only one Dark Hunter? That's all you see. Well, no, I mean... Well, yeah, I, I don't really know, but... I suppose I, I could word it in a way that to try and stop all dark hunters from hunting us. Well, uh, let's actually pause here for a moment and give you a moment to 
actually work out your precise language and who you are including in this list, because this is something that matters in the context of this spell. So yeah, you can think on that for a little bit, Justin. Maybe write it in the text chat exactly what you want to say to this Dark Hunter, including the list of names you can think of. And then when I come back to you, we'll say that's like the time that you had, right? You know, kind of give you a little time crush on it. So we'll pop back over to Mr. Whitmire as he has tried a dreaming, one dreaming roll. Of course, you didn't use the luck option. We do, of course, always have the option to push, but you're not certain what that entails. Like right now you've been, you've been stuck in just your normal dreams. So you can do things like modify stuff if you so desire, but you don't seem to be piercing the wall of sleep into the uh, the stairwell deeper slumber or anything like that. You're just stuck in your own dreams. Did you want to attempt a push or just leave it as is? No, as a, I don't think I'm going to push it as I, I don't, but I'm not sure what the risks of it would be as who knows if I'm expelled from the dreams altogether forever. So as I'll just uh, take it as it wasn't meant to be today. Okay. Well, you wake momentarily after your attempt, but it's kind of one of those you can easily go back to sleep if you want, or you can go on to try to do something else. When you look at your your watch, you can see it's only a little past midnight. Well, seeing as how I failed on my own, um, I'll head over to where I'm expecting Lance Monroe to be at his house. Okay. Yeah, so uh, you can see when you arrive there that his house is closed up. It doesn't appear as though there's anybody home yet. The museum, of course, is closed as well. All right. I'm going to... I don't think he had one of those in his house, but I do believe he had one in the museum. What? One of the statues, right? Oh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to go break into his museum. <laughs> <laughs> That is a very Jimmy Whitmire thing to do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, I got to get into this dream world, man. <laughs> well, you know there's a, there's a, what do you call it? The front door, but you also know that the storeroom had a back entry as well. Yeah. yeah. Is that the and one you prefer? You probably knew that I had one of those little toad statues in my storeroom as well. I had one on display and one in my storeroom. Yeah, I was going to go through the, the back entrance there. Well, it's a simple lock. He doesn't, he's, he has a meager income, so he can't afford the latest and greatest in security. So it only takes, you did it with a hard success. So yeah, you snap it open or pick it open and you're in the storeroom and uh, it had been bundled away, but he had it pretty well labeled, I think. And you, you guys had spent a little bit of time in there looking at everything. So it's only a matter of time before you can pry it out of its box and, and hold the I think it was uh, made from late. He had a pewter one, and I think it's probably the pewter one. There we go. Yeah. All right. So this one looks like it was more of a modern construction made out of pewter, and it's this squat bat-like toad-like figure. And it does leave you somewhat unsettled, but only because you understand the connotation of the being it depicts to a limited degree. But uh, yeah, there you are. You have it in your hands. So I'm going to relock his the storeroom door and then like crawl up into some of the racks. Okay. Is that way I'm hidden and then I'll I'll try and fall asleep in there. Just right. as good as a safe house. <laughs> yeah, not bad. Nobody knows you're there. Uh the only issue with the storeroom at the moment is there is a a uh, Egyptian style sarcophagus that you understand is probably a gate box. And it's kind of like sitting with your back to a door or, you know, sleeping on a slope or something where it it uh, it messes with you a little bit in a way, kind of disturbs your sleep and it takes you a few minutes to get there. So while you're trying to get yourself to sleep. I'll climb back down and put like a cup or something <laughs> on the lid. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, that does seem to help. And you uh, drift off to sleep and you find yourself in your own dreams initially but they are disturbed and distorted, every one of them as you go through them. But you do have an opportunity, if you'd like, to 
as you did in the dreamlands, if you wanted to make something, you're not certain if it will work in this dream that they've talked about, but this would be your opportunity to try it. Okay. And what, what did I have to do for that? So it, there was, um, you understood when you made your shotgun or when you altered things in the dream, it had a magic point cost and you needed to succeed at a dreaming roll. Your shotgun, for example, cost you 12 magic points. Yeah, I only have two left. Well, I don't think I have enough. When was that? How long? That was like around four, um, I think, when you guys woke up. So you would have, yeah, what, uh, eight back? Yeah. Give or take? Okay. Um, well, if I reach into my pocket, is my, uh, is that wool still there? Oh, in your dreams? Your, yeah. Your normal dreams? No, you don't have any of those items, nor are you dressed. It seems dependent on the dream because it, Sometimes they're attached to something that happened in your life or they're completely fantastical. So they seem to be drifting up from your subconscious at this stage. Okay. If you don't have the mana. Well, I will, I will try to create, oof. yeah, I'll try to create a, uh, a shotgun again. Well, I don't have enough because I got to get in and eat the mana. Hmm. For right now, because I know that I can try and alter the dream when I'm inside of it too. It's just harder. Because I think I'll I'll save the magic points for that, I, unless okay. there's some type of cost for for trying to create more mana in there. You're not certain if I'm gonna try that at least as uh, to to enter the dream with with uh, that with mana that I can eat. Oh, that you had from the your when you were around Ulthar. Well, either that mana or some other, right? Okay. All right. Well, we will leave that to. Just your dreaming roll. Yeah. Um, yeah, this time you're... I'll try the 10. I'll use the... What is that? 11 luck? I'll use that. Uh, nine. Nine? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Because I'll use the nine luck. Okay. So in this case, you're, you you come out of a dream. It, it's sort of mundane. You're just hanging around on a street corner as you often did in your younger days. And uh, then you find yourself just in the blink of an eye, and a broad field in which you can see a windmill some 50 yards away and beyond that a mound. And there's something about the dream that vaguely unsettles you. You can't quite put your finger on it. It's like waking up early in in Boston on a foggy morning where not a lot of people are out, and you can sometimes convince yourself that you must be the only person, the only living person left on the earth. And that's the sensation that unnerves you when you come into this dream place, uh, as well as something threatening about the mound in the distance. However, you are pleased to find yourself in that suit with your small little dagger, your bread, your water, and your mana. Nice. All right. So um, I am going to eat some of that mana. What was that, a 1d6? Uh, D4. D4. So yeah, you got three more magic points. I think, you know, let me double check that. Been a while since we did it, actually. One second here. Okay, yeah, D four. All right, so you got three more magic points, and you. All right. To your most current understanding, you're supposed to meet Monroe here. So, are you gonna uh, wait a while? Yeah. Were we supposed to meet right here, or were were we meeting anywhere specific? I guess we didn't say exactly, but we kind of infer since much of the discussion about the dream spoke about starting in the same place that perhaps it would just be best to wait for others to appear in the dream. Okay. Yeah. So I'll, uh, I'll go and find a spot that's, uh, fairly close by if I can, where I can kind of, you know, either sit or, you know, lay flat and still watch that area. Okay. All right. Yeah. You, you get to that. And after a short time, you can even shake off the general unease you have of being there. Uh, by focusing your mind on other tasks. But back to Mr. Monroe. Have you got that wording for us that it's now so. or never? <laughs> you want to you wanna role play it? <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. So the instructions were to command it in a deep, strong voice. And thinking about um, the way that the consortium member had mentioned that the Dark Hunter exists in a different form of time and that it doesn't exist exactly in our time. and the consequences that come from from the the wrong command. I had thought about time paradoxes and and 
if this is the same dark hunter and exists in a different time and trying to command it not to attack us uh, may cause some sort of problem since it already has uh, the command I eventually came up with. And I'll, I'll say this is I command you to stop all incarnations of dark hunters from any further harm or hunting of myself, Dr. Andrews, Jimmy Whitmire, Johan Mueller, Mr. McCracken, and I can't remember their names, their first names uh, offhand, so I would be saying first name rather than Mr. or in addition to. Okay. Dr. Andrews, Jimmy Whitmire, Johan Mueller, Mr. McCracken, Dr. Call, Mr. Clark, or Detective Nichols, refusing any future requests to do us harm, capture us, or impede us in any way. All right, so as the... The sound from the, the last syllable you utter dies into silence. The dark hunter just stands there swaying, looking at you with its malformed head, like its half-formed head, its incomplete features, but then it departs back into the portal without a word. Okay. And the portal closes, and then you're left there for a time in silence before Mr. Blackman finally breaks it and says, Well done, Mr. Monroe. I believe I have underestimated you. Yes, uh, it's not the first time someone has. I appreciate your assistance, and I fully intend to follow through on our deal to leave your plans alone. for. Well, that is good, but I'm afraid this aid we have offered does not come without a cost. Yes, I had assumed as much. Uh, what is it that you wish of me? Well, we had sent you a gift to your museum. And we require that you display it in a prominent place. It is important to our operations. Why do you need access to my museum in that way? Well, though you perhaps don't think this of yourself, you are now working for us, Mr. Monroe. And you are just one of many points, folks, on a wheel that must turn ever forward. Furthermore... We will be sending various items to your museum that we will require be sold or displayed, but you needn't worry about that straight away. It will come in time. I assume there will be no disagreement with this. Well, I will put this, the sarcophagus on display as you have requested, but any future requests I, I must consider. I have no intentions of doing harm to the general public uh, just at your whim. And I believe that the trade of putting the sarcophagus in my museum will be sufficient for the assistance that you've given me here. I have no intention of defying you, but once again, I must consider case by case what you ask. And I must insist that if I follow through that I am left my own autonomy and that I am not, uh, what would be the term, replaced by any of the members of the consortium. Yeah, he's, there's, he has kind of a, a strange mix of emotions across his face because you dropped some hints about things that, I know. you know, maybe you he didn't expect you to have knowledge of, but he composes himself and he says, well, okay for now, but perhaps this will be renegotiated in the future. As all deals are. And he uh, calls over your shoulder to Dr. Call and he's like, Dr. Call, we have heard of you. I have a task for you, if you would like to come with us. And you're, you're sort of surprised at this. You look over at Dr. Call, and he himself seems surprised. He kind of like, who, me? And uh, he looks to you for, like, help. Like, what? Uh, uh, Mr. Monroe, do I go with them, or, or what? What's going on here? Well, these men have more knowledge of the arcane than you or even I could even grasp at this moment, uh, but I would be wary, and I'll, I'll turn to Mr. Black and I'll say, what sort of task do you have for him? That is between me and Dr. Call, Mr. Monroe, but only if he is willing, of course, Dr. Call. Is this so, a, a matter that can wait a day or two? I'm afraid that we may need his assistance in a matter that we are uh, taking care of this week. Of course. We will be in touch, Dr. Call. Farewell, Mr. Monroe. Farewell. And they depart across the these grounds, you know, disappearing in, into indiscernible shadows of the night. And you and Dr. Call are left on your own in the Chapel of Contemplation. 
once they're out of sight, I'm going to kind of collapse against a wall okay. with how much energy and, and focus was required. Mr. Monroe, are, are you okay? I'll say I'm, I'm quite all right. I'm just rather exhausted. Uh, performing those rituals is tiring and not just of the body, but of the mind and the soul as well. Uh, what, what has happened? I saw you begin the ritual, but then there's a gap in my memory. And, and then Dr. Call was, or sorry, Mr. Blackman was addressing me. Well, what has happened? Well, I seem to have brokered some level of protection for ourselves, you included, uh, from some dark entities that may strive to hurt people. Well, so I, that is to the good, I, I should think. Uh, what is to happen next? You look exhausted, man. Are, are we, are we to take to the dream in in any case, or? I'll I'll kind of take a deep breath and I'll say yes, yes. I believe I still have um, enough ha of myself intact to at least do a preliminary investigation with you. So to that end, I I would uh, suggest that you head home and prepare yourself in the manner that we had spoken of for the lucid dreaming, and I will do my best to see you there. And with any luck, we will also find Mr. Whitmire there as well. Okay, must, um, go ahead. I must caution you, if you speak to Mr. Blackman again, know that uh, he does not particularly hold human life in the same regards that we do, and you must be a bit wary of any deals that you make with him. I understand fully, Mr. Monroe. I... I only considered briefly his offer. It is tempting, but I hold true to my friends, and I would have gone with you into this dream no matter what he had offered in return. You guys have been kind man, to me. Sir. You are a very good man, and I, I value your company and your assistance in ways that I cannot measure. And I yours. So we'll, uh, just to smooth things over, we'll assume you guys return to... Well, where do you want to go? I suppose we could um, both go back to my apartment over my my museum. Okay. And, uh, he could use the couch, or I I suppose I could use the couch since I'm more accustomed to, to dreaming. <laughs> with <laughs> with no understanding that Whitmire's just beyond a few thin walls in a store. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's passed out in a storeroom downstairs. <laughs> okay, so with Monroe and Dr. Call back at his museum and his apartments there. You guys settle in for sleep. Now, Mr. Monroe, you will have the same opportunity to try this dream item creation before you enter the place with the burial mound, if you want to. Okay. So, yeah, I'll try it with uh, some things that are fairly simple. So I'll, I'll, I'll try, like, uh, make sure I have a lighter and some rope with me. Okay. Uh, that's dependent on a successful dreaming roll. Yeah. Oof. I think I've used up my luck for the week. Yeah, it does. In that, in the case of those two items, it does cost you two magic points. Okay. Did you want to try any more or just shift into the dream? I suppose I'll just shift into the dream, figuring that I don't have the, the presence of mind right now, as exhausted as I am. Okay. Yeah, and that exhaustion carries over when you appear on this open field, but you see... Whitmire's kind of find found a, a place to to hang out for a little while. He's already there, and it's not too long after when when Doctor Call appears, completely giddy at when he sees you, and you're all in the same place in a shared dream state. While you appear in what you were wearing in your last dream, you can see that Mister Whitmire has the suit that he wears when you guys were in Ulthar, and there he has his little pouch with the bread and the water skin and the mana, and, uh, but anyhow, you guys are all there. Let me, before we begin, I'll get a power roll from everybody. Oof. Oh, that, see, that's what I needed to see on my check. I don't suppose I can use luck for that. To do what? I failed my power roll. Yeah, you can. Okay, so yeah, uh, I'll use uh, six luck. I'll use five. Good choice. He yeah, actually, I rolled a 57 versus 55, so... He narrowly missed his power, but I mean, nothing, nothing happens. It's kind of like a, a background thing that's going on. But anyhow, you guys are all there. So let's lay it out here. In your past journeys here, Mr. Monroe, you had gone into the mound and down through some various areas and you had gone in several different paths. Once you reach 
a place. Once you go past the Hall of History, there's this place you're calling the Pitch. Uh, one time you went into an area that ended up being like, well, we'll just call it the music chamber, where you saw this mm-hmm. strange organ with impelled, the impelled heads of hominids on the pipes and that the seat that you sat in. Yeah. Uh, another time you went in a direction that led you ultimately to, you might describe it as a plantation, uh, yeah. concerned with growing large stocks of fungus. And I'm trying to remember, you didn't get beyond it the very first time because you actually woke yourself up breaking your legs the very first time going down the pitch. Yeah. So you know those... Time, sorry, what's that? I think, a sec- I think a second time as well. Yeah. I didn't manage to get there. <laughs> so you think you could ref- you could retrace your way there with a successful intelligence role or navigate, but also you're kind of perhaps intrigued at Dr. Andrew's tale of his journey here where he went beyond the mound some miles distant to an installation near a radio tower. And when, as he described it, he went down that path, he came into a procession hall, not too dissimilar from the one that you had seen, although distinctly different because he came down there through the installation. And beyond that, there was some sort of suspended animation chamber or breeding pit for these serpent folk, and then a freezer that had bodies in it. So what do you guys want to do? I was going to pose the question to these two on which direction they wanted to go. Well, what was it, our purpose here? I think, um, if I remember right, you guys were basically doing a scouting <laughs> mission. So it's just to yeah. gather more information. Okay. But so kind of, did Dr. Andrews say that there was more to explore in the installation? Well, he mentioned that there was a columned opening at the end of this procession hall where on one side there were... Uh, like a honeycomb structure of gate box exits into the procession hall. And at the opposite end, there was a columned entry to where he saw the consortium members leading the man, but he doesn't know what's beyond there. Nor did he get further than the where he saw the breeding area or the animation chamber, but there was more to go. And do you want to check that area, or would you rather check the uh, try to get through the area that you were already exploring? I'm trying to remember when I got back to the, uh, when I got to that pipe organ chamber, whether there was anything past that. There was. That was just where the dream had ended for you. Okay. For reasons Um, that escaped me at the moment. But I mentioned that I might be able to get us back there, or if we want, I was also curious on whether or not those gateways that Mr. Andrews or Dr. Andrews had uh, mentioned we can recognize where any of them get out, including perhaps my shop. All right. Well, why don't we start there and then either if we have enough time here or maybe next trip, if there is one, we can go and explore the pipe or what's beyond the pipe organ room. That's fair enough. Um, Because if there's a way in here from your shop and we don't have to use these statues, I, I would prefer that especially with the side effects that they seem to bring. Well, I I am a little bit hesitant to go there in the flesh. Uh, there's a certain level of protection that we get through being here in a dream that I don't believe we would have if we passed through a gateway and came here in the waking world. Yeah, and Dr. Call becomes a font of questions as you guys are talking, where if you entertain him, you have to stop and explain things that you now uh, take for granted. And he continues to do so throughout the the journey, as I say, just absolutely giddy at the prospect. Yeah. As I'll uh, try and draw his attention to creating something, as uh, you know, we don't know what we're going to encounter or if it's even illuminated, why don't you focus your mind on creating an electric torch? Oh, that is quite fascinating. I suppose it, it makes sense. You know, dreams come from our subconscious, we should be able to alter them in some way. Uh, yes, what do I do? I'll kind of Just run through the process, it? yeah, that that uh, we had in, in the other dream where I was trying to create something. And I'll let him know is it is a lot more difficult to create something in the dream rather than before you come to the dream, if that makes sense. Yes, I, uh, Mr. Monroe had said as much. I just did not have the presence of mind 
in my other dreams to even think of it. I, I was marveling at the ability to even recognize that I was in a dream. But uh, yes, I shall think on it. Give me just a moment. Let's, let's hold here for just a moment. Nice. Well, he got a regular success, but he needed oh. a higher one than that. So, you know, he's kind of like focusing his mind at a point before him. And yeah, maybe, maybe you thought you saw something, but then again, maybe not. But finally, he, he sort of lets out a sigh and he's like, oh, well, I just, I don't know. I, I can't seem to get anything to happen. I can't even tell if anything is happening. As it, I think you were close. I I almost saw something, but like I said, it is very very difficult. Uh, you something you should definitely continue to practice uh, while we're here. Is no problem. fear not. I I myself have have yet to be able to manifest something in the way that Mister Whitmire has. Yeah, can I try and create an electric torch? You can. It will. Cost you two magic points and a successful dreaming roll. Oh, nope. So it's st- you still lose the magic points, but in your particular case, it, it does resolve itself in your hand, but it's only there for just a second before it blinks out of existence. And you're you're reminded of your talk with Robert Ramsden, Ramsden of creating things within the dreamlands was much more difficult because the dreamlands was not just your subconscious. It was... In his theory, a collective. So it could uh, be that there's some other force that presses back against this dream state that is, corrects any changes that you might make to it. So in in remembering that, I'm going to request that we all focus on a single torch. That uh, who are we here with? You said Doctor. We're not. It's not Doctor Call, is it? Dr. Edward Call. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we all focus on a single electric torch that is in the hand of Dr. Call. Okay, all right, I'm, I'm willing to give it a shot. All right, so you all uh, will have to spend one magic point in this case, and then you two can throw out your dreaming roll. There you go. <laughs> oh, he, well, he still needs that extreme, Dr. Call. Oh, he needs an extreme? All yeah. right. Uh, Sorry, so it, it if I was to use luck to succeed at the dreaming roll, would we still fail? No, no. If you use luck, you would succeed. Okay, as I will it do that. It does still cost you each a magic point, but yeah, it only needed one of your successes there. All right, yeah. So the Doctor Call is delighted to find a electric torch in his hand, and he, you know, flicks the button on to turn the light on, and it seems to work, and he he squills. Like, that's the only <laughs> term you can come up with to describe the sound he makes, but he's very pleased. And he's just like, amazing, this is amazing. I never would have dreamt it. I'll say, well, <laughs> but you have. Let's, let's continue <laughs> onward, and I will answer any questions I can while we make our way to the radio tower. So I'll answer his questions as we're walking. Right. And I'd like to like take a path that would bring us past the entrance that I'd been going into. And point to it and and just note it for both of them that down that way is the way to the labyrinth of the ancient tunnel works that I had been exploring before. Okay, so beyond the mound, the land slopes away. It's pretty gentle, but the radio tower is some ways distance and it takes you quite a while to get there. Just like in Ulthar, it was difficult to gauge time, you know, you don't. You don't see the sun really moving across the sky. You're just in this sort of, there is a sun, but it, it it's almost frozen it's in its position for those that marked it on their arrival. It does not seem to have moved. But you do think you get there, your guess would be, you know, maybe 30 minutes, but who knows. But you're at the outside of this installation, which is fenced off. It has the radio tower and then a single story building um, that is beyond a fence and you approach it from what appears to be the back side of it and you can see one entry into that building near the radio tower but i'll leave it to you guys as you stand outside this fence uh, you don't see anybody you don't see any wildlife or even hear it for that matter okay i, I suppose we just follow the way that dr anders had said he got in yeah okay yeah, so according to his story, he had gone around the front and then scaled the fence and just went in through the front door. And you guys are in the process of doing that. I didn't require a skill roll. 
I was just checking to see if you fumbled, so we'll go ahead and do that now. Roll out your climb. No fumble. Well, I definitely don't make it look easy. It's a little sad to me that Dr. Carl and I both <laughs> rolled the same. <laughs> <laughs> we managed the same amount of success. Yeah, so you go over one at a time, and Dr. Call being the last, his feet hit the compacted dirt that is this little path to a uh, a canopy sort of shed area where you see a, a truck is parked in there, and uh, beyond that would be the main entry. All right, uh, since Dr. Call has our, our light, you're first, buddy. <laughs> and you're, you're certain, Mr. Monroe, that this... This dream state is a protection to any harm? Well, I can't guarantee it's entirely imperviating or makes us impervious to harm, but I myself have suffered several injuries while in the dream that were not there when I woke up, and I have seen uh, other people also suffer injuries that they were not affected by once they awoke. So while I I don't know for certain, I I do know that it affords at least some level of protection. And I can safely guarantee you that I've never woken up injured from the dream world either. Well, nothing for it then but to press forward. Good okay. man. <laughs> he uh, makes sure his, his light is on and he opens the door and reveals a hallway that is well lit. So it ends up that at least at this stage the electric torch is not needed. But you guys proceed cautiously down the hallway. And as I had described to Mr. Andrews, you had rooms on either side but to your immediate right into that first entry, that door is open and you can see there's a lot of radio equipment, but it is it is odd to your eyes. It doesn't, like Mr. Whitmire, you saw radio equipment in the basement of that university. And while you can sometimes recognize the function of the various devices down here, they are designed in a different way. And furthermore, there are certain devices that you don't know what the function is. But once you're in there, where would you guys like to go? Room by room or just proceeding past the installation to where Dr. Andrews had said there was a stairwell? Because I think we should go to where he left off. Because didn't he go room to room on this? Yeah. 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 As I'll, I'll trust his judgment. I mean, we can look into him real quick to make sure there's nothing that might impede our way. But And I'd like to... Take a quick glance in that radio room and see if there's any, perhaps any sign that uh, Mr. Beckett <clears throat> may have been using this radio. Okay, it doesn't, there does not seem to be any sign of its use. It just is sitting here like idle. You can't even tell if it's been used recently, but as you're looking around it, you do see a pretty thick cable that's running from the equipment in here and... It goes up to the ceiling and then it runs along the corner of the, the ceiling in that hallway and it goes down in towards one of the doors where it there's actually a part in the wall where it runs through. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll follow that and kind of just say offhandedly as I'm following it to Mr. Whitmire and Dr. Call that perhaps this is how the young Mr. Beckett has been communicating. If Maybe if we follow this, then we can locate the young man. It's it's possible. It's... Yeah, well, opening that door to where the cable runs, you see it's the descending stairwell that Dr. Andrews had spoken about. Okay. Uh, it, can we still see the cable or did it like... Yeah, yeah. Cable? Like once there, you have bare bulbs just hanging, you know, just maybe like six inches from the ceiling and that cable just runs along the ceiling as it descends downward. Okay. So, yeah, I'll, I'll mention... Perhaps we can do more than just scout. Perhaps we can find out some more information about what is going on. Uh, if you don't mind, if we follow this cable for a little bit. Sure. Okay, so with the good doctor call and lead and instructions to keep an eye on that cable and follow it, you guys descend this stairwell, which does, once again, as I described to Dr. Andrews, run downward for quite a bit, and it terminates onto what you realize is a, a sort of balcony overlooking the this procession hall that he had mentioned which had these uh on the rail there it had like miniature versions of zagua that were holding up the upper part of the rail uh, that acts as a guard from falling in the procession hall and immediately as you exit 
the stairwell, and you look to your right, you see this honeycomb combed structure, some 64 like bulkhead doors uh, stacked eight by eight, basically. Uh, um, you see all these exits from what you presume and what Dr. Andrews had seen when he went into one were these gate boxes that are strewn about Boston and who knows where else. However, unlike Dr. Andrews' experience here, the procession hall is quiet and there's nobody passing through. And Dr. Call shines his electric torch on that cable, which makes an immediate deviation from the ceiling to run down into that procession hall. Okay. Looks like that's the way we go. Should we take a moment to see if we can see if that sarcophagus is on this wall somewhere? Yeah, I am interested to look at the symbols and see if it matches up with either that or the one that's in the uh, was it the Wilbur Theater that I'd seen. Oh, okay. Yeah, you uh, from this end, you can kind of just lean over that balcony a little bit over the railing and look at the two nearest bulkhead doors, and they do have some symbols carved on them, but you realize that they're not the ACLO you saw on the other side of the gate boxes. They're what Mr. Monroe presumes, at least, are is the script that these this evolved race of serpent folk must use. Is it's the same script he saw in their in their device that he sat in, where symbols floated before him and he could interact with them in an odd way. Can you so again, recall any of those? Uh I'll say I I never really managed to decipher what how to read them or what these symbols mean, although I've been trying to remember as many of them as I can when I wake and, and scribe them into my journal in hopes that perhaps we could find them somewhere else in the waking world and give us a, a little bit more insight. What well, would you it both be have without a, 1%, a skill, uh, like intelligence chance. or education? No, it, it's, it's its own language, which they begin at. One uh, percent. So okay. that's where you're starting with. Just but Monroe's on the right path. If he gathers enough of it, then you know there's he could begin to go through the process of actually deciphering the language, probably with help. But you know, yeah, he's got bits of the alphabet at least. But yeah, I'll I'll try and memorize a few more. I might recognize ones that I had seen before, but yeah, I'll try and memorize how a few more look so I can describe them. Can I try that as well, as ones that he is not currently memorizing? Yeah, sure. I'll just make, you know, just make a mental note that you recorded down a few symbols when you guys wake from this dream. Uh, I can say that the Arabic numeral system is in use on these doors, so you do pick those up, you know. Like, you're just not sure what the letters associate them to, but in some cases they'll it'll be in a series, so they'll go they'll run from like one to four with the same set of letters in in front of the number but it's not always there's not always four in a serial sometimes there are a set of doors that are not serialized at all but you're not sure on the rhyme or reason to it we can kind of get some sort of pattern or something like that that kind of conveys that each one of these is for a specific location or something like that yeah you could definitely make such a hypothesis okay but Dr. Maybe. Call's been shining his flashlight along this cord as it ran down into the chamber. And there he sees it runs along uh, one corner where the floor meets a uh, wall, and it travels on to that columned chamber. Oh, into the, the sanctuary or wherever they had taken, or Dr. Andrews said they had taken that guy? Yes. Oh, well, I suppose we should move on. All right, let's go. All right, so... According to Dr. Andrews, if you proceed down this balcony area, then you will go into the room where the cold storage was. But if you are to follow the cord, then you would have to scale over the balcony, which was about 15 feet down to the procession hall. Yeah, I don't think I could do that. Um, <clears throat> do we want to try and create some rope? I already tried that. <laughs> well, everybody focus on a rope that's knotted for climbing. Focus it. And it will appear in Mr. Monroe's hand. I'm afraid I I don't believe I can assist in this. Uh, the ritual that I performed tonight and then my attempts at creating earlier have nearly drained me completely. Well, I would be glad to offer my service, Ms. Mr. Whitmire. Are you ready to begin? 
is I'll pull a little bit of that mana out and hand it to uh, Mr. Monroe. Okay. Is that way he can eat that? Yeah, I'll eat that. So you get a D4 magic point. Nice. nice. Congratulations, maximum. Yeah. So for this one, it will cost you each a magic point, and you may make your dreaming roll. Nice. Uh, dreaming. Well, once again, Doc, I'm I will. Keep well, getting to hit extreme. Okay, Ooh, I was gonna say if he doesn't make his, I'll use the <laughs> one luck that I need to make mine. <laughs> All right. So yeah, it's it's a little bit uncertain on who is actually succeeding at this, but once again, the the rope does manifest itself. You said it was to appear in Monroe's uh, hand? Yes, and knotted for climbing. Yeah, so you have a very strong length of rope that appears in your hand, Mr. Monroe, that is knotted every two or three feet to assist in climbing. Yeah, I'll exclaim, wow, it does work. I, that's the first time I've managed to make it work, and I, it must be because of your assistance. I appreciate the help, but this so is I think magnificent. It's the power of the group once we're in the dream. As before you come to the dream, that's just the power of you. Well, I'll have to explore it some more as, as time goes on. But I suppose that we uh, should probably move forward. Yes, uh, let's let's tie off um, over here. And I'll, I'll try and choose a, a point of that uh, railing that has that's uh, secured either to wall or floor. Okay. As, yeah, as so our tie off point. Finding a good spot, and with the quality of the rope and it being such a short distance, you don't really have to make a skill roll to get down it. Just the fumble check? No, actually, what we're going to do is have you each make a luck roll, but who's going first? Let's all lead the way. All right, make a luck roll as you descend. Oh, man, that luck is almost gone. I know. <laughs> you, uh, you, even with... Not being a practice climber, it's with the knots there and everything, it's it's really easy to get down. So who is to follow Mr. Whitmire? I suppose Dr. Call would probably go second and then I'll come last. Okay. And Dr. Call makes his climb down and he remarks that, oh, I haven't been climbing since I was a boy, but it's weird. I don't seem to get tired in this place. Well, I'm a little tired, but not as much <laughs> as I expected. As time moves differently here, and our our body's energy level seems to be affected differently as well. What's even more amazing is that even with all this exertion, I've never woken up tired. That is amazing. Is that the same for you, Mr. Monroe? Well, I, I can't say that I've never woken up tired. Every time I, I have one of those situations where I'm forcibly removed, I, I seem to wake up a little bit weary. So I, I usually quickly recover after a good cup of coffee. I see. Do so. your luck roll. I want to see if you say that and <laughs> fall to your doom. Come on down, Mr. Monroe. <laughs> All right. Here we go. I yeah. knew it. <laughs> I'm the one. Yeah. I never okay, so. have been a tired occasionally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what happens is as you are descending that the rope ceases to exist. Your oh. ability to manifest it here. It's. Whatever is controlling the stream, it has snapped back to its default base. So when you're about five feet down, it vanishes from your hand. I try a dexterity to try and grab him? Yeah, sure. Uh, like, let's make it up. Oh, well, you, you beat it. Yeah. Yeah. So I will say that breaks the fall sufficiently enough that Mr. Monroe will avoid the D6 roll required. However, it will just deal each of you a point of damage. Hit points or magic? Uh, ma or hit points. Sorry about that. And do I need to keep track of what I was before I came into the dream? Well, we'll I think we'll probably remember to erase the hit point damage, right? Or were you lower? I was at 9 of 12 for my broken ribs. Oh, okay, you yeah. Said that, that, that would take days to, to fully recover right. from, so. Yeah, so maybe keep a, sec a separate note for your hit points. Dr. Calls congratulates you, Mr. Whitmire. He says, that was amazing reflexes, sir. So I've always had... Quick hands, and I'll turn on the flashlight. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, it is dim in this area. I, I failed to mention it, although I did with Andrews, is that there's these uh, crystalline structures that sort of have a pulsing light to them. Not Maybe pulsing isn't the right word. It will just dim every now and then and then flare, but it's in a gentle 
sort of dim and flare pattern. But yes, you guys are at the bottom of this procession hall, and behind you, you again see the honeycombed bulkhead doors. There is that ladder that can, just like in a library, it can be moved laterally so that you can climb up to different parts of the structure. But in the opposite direction is the columned entryway into what is beyond, and there's a kind of almost artificial darkness beyond those columns, and it, it does fill you with a kind of animal uh, instinct of, of dread or a desire to avoid it. Where does that cable go? Does it go into the darkness? Yes. Well, looks like that's that's the way we got to go. And I'll, I'll kind of give a small laugh and say, Mr. Wertmeyer reminds me of uh, Peru. How about you? Yeah, as I hopefully we'll have just as successful an outcome. <laughs> yes, uh, and and I'll I'll be kind of stalling a little bit as I I I talk to him, you know, trying to find any excuse not to continue <laughs> moving forward while still pretending to want to. Uh, yeah, so. but yes, it is a game of chicken to determine who takes the first step. As, as, uh, well, just like Peru, <laughs> as uh, I'll I'll go into the hole first. Okay, so. As you approach the column opening, and again, this is an echo back to Peru, the smell of death permeates everywhere, and each footfall as you near it stirs this dust up from the floor, and you begin to see grisly and decayed gobs of rotting, you don't know what, they're little morsels, and uh, in one case you do make out a severed hand, in the other case you make out putrid innards or worse, and the area begins to feel restrictive somehow as though you have suddenly become aware of the oppressive weight of earth and stone above that you weren't in a way before. But in any case, you need to pass a constitution roll. Got a hard success. All right, I missed yours, Mr. Monroe. No, I didn't do it yet. <laughs> Oof. Okay, so you are you are overcome with uh, gagging okay. for a little okay. while. You guys, breathe through your mouth. It's not that bad. <laughs> I think this happened to you in the Peru Pyramid as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I can take on dark deities all day long. <laughs> <laughs> the smell. But the smell of death is, is too much for me. Yeah, and uh, Dr. Call chokes out between gag and he's like, God, what is that? Is it, but you can push through it. You know, you're just retching every now and then. It seems to be the common smell of ancient deities as they seem to be surrounded with death. Ugh. Okay. I think I can, I think I can press forward now. And he empties his stomach on the ground. That sends me into doing the same thing. <laughs> but, uh, when you guys are finished emptying your stomach, which is kind of strange because it, it doesn't bear any relationship to what you actually ate for the day. Uh, in fact, it's kind of like in your case, Doctor, or sorry, Mister Monroe. It's a, it's an odd mix of. Well, you're not sure what they are. They look like different snails or something like that. You're not sure. They're just weird shelled creatures that start to wriggle away a little bit from your what was in your stomach. But go and give me a sanity loss roll. Oof. Oh. <laughs> well, <That's> nice. Push it. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's a that's a critical failure. Yeah, There's no pushing. <laughs> yeah, on a fumble, it you lose the max possible for this the great. event, which and is four. Okay. You narrowly avoid the uh, temporary madness, but uh, it does does disturb you, and you wonder if this presages whatever strange appetite you would gain if if that effect were to be applied to you. You're not sure, but nevertheless, it leaves your skin crawling. And your stomach flipping anew. All right. <laughs> and I would say for for the next few moments, you at least will not be the one to forge between the columns first. We'll likely have to fall to Whitmire again, unless yeah. you can convince. Okay. Does right. uh, Dr. Call also vomit up something unique? Yeah. And in his particular case, it was filled with bolts, uh, like metal bolts. He's seen worse. <laughs> yeah, he holds it. I didn't know he had a 90. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's pretty grounded, man. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We need to break him down a little bit. 
All right. Yeah. So with Whitmire leading the w- the way, and I suppose Dr. Call falling behind him, and Monroe in the w- rear, you head into the dark entry between the columns, and you're in some unworked interior space in the earth, and you're casting your light around. You see uh, the interior or beyond is there's some kind of electric equipment set up there. Uh, you do recognize a great microphone that has been rolled. It has the shape of microphones you've seen out in the world, but it's of a much larger size, and it's just rolled against the wall. And at the far end of the area, beyond some stone basins filled with a dark liquid that is stirred by some unseen current, you see the formless mass of its body upon which lolls a massive toad-like head. This thing's bulk is immense and covered with a loathsome and glistening brown fur. Two legs and two arms sprout from the fleshy mass, all possessing unnatural multi-angled joints and equipped with wicked-looking claws. Its face is dire, with slitted eyes revealing yellow-red glowing orbs above a grinning mouth running from edge to edge. Within are gleaming rows of jagged teeth. Translucent skin stretches across its belly, giving a full view of its digestive process, and you even see the shape of some humanoid thing uh, float against this translucent skin, although it's been dissolved to a degree that you can't make out features, and you're, uh, this is all in the narrow beam of your electric torch. So let's begin nope. with a sand roll again. Congratulations, Whitmire. Oof. Keep closing, Dr. Call. I didn't see anything. Was it in a whisper? Oh. There it is. So he's like, oh. Uh, I've seen worse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, in this particular case, it's still, even on a failure, it's still worth a D4 sand loss. All right. Okay. Okay. And finally, before we do anything else, let's get a group luck rule. So who amongst us has <laughs> the low uh, I think that's me. I'm, yeah. I think we know who. Yeah. Yes. Oh, <laughs> Suck it. Oh my goodness. <laughs> hard success. Not just, a, not just a luck success, but a hard success versus a seventeen. Yeah. All right, Mister Whitmire. In the event of a failed group luck roll, your this would be the time your electric electric torch disappears. But you see it begin to flicker in, and uh, the adrenaline that courses through your body and your your frantic will for it not to disappear seems to hold it into place at least for a little while longer but as you sweep the light across this creature and the two basins before it you see the uh, dark liquid begin to move out of the basins it it uh moves out in these dark glistening ropes these formless shapes and starts flowing across the ground towards you and well we'll have to figure out what happens next time Thanks for playing, guys. Nice. Thanks, Travis. <laughs> this was quite the the adventure. Um. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, uh, um, I guess get the luck rolls out there, I think. This has been a Death Watch production. Thank you for listening. Mm-hmm.